the three generations of cryptocurrency, typified by Litecoin, Chainlink, and Cardano. To keep your head during cryptocurrency volatility, it helps to have a good idea of the evolution of cryptocurrency in general. Having this knowledge in your tool belt will allow you to make sound decisions and evaluate your investing decisions for yourself, even when the price of your favorite currency is going through the floor. In this video, we'll go over the three generations of cryptocurrency, and by the end, you will know why some of the best cryptocurrencies were some of the first, and how cryptocurrency is evolving for the future. And I'll also give you a warning about the dangers ahead in the current cryptocurrency bubble that we all find ourselves in. So be sure to softly, gently, tenderly, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm, and let's get started. So cryptocurrency is all over the news. Every time you turn on your favorite financial news channel, visit your favorite financial website, or watch your favorite entrepreneur and personal finance YouTuber, TikTok, or Instagram channel, <clears throat> uh, like and subscribe. You can't help but hear about how much it exploded today, or about which new currency is on the rise, or in some cases, how much it fell. It's pretty much ubiquitous, as I'm sure you know. Cryptocurrency used to be the talk of the nerdiest geeks in the computer science department, and conspiracy theorists, and folks that were interested in Federal Reserve policy, all snooze fests. Since then, it's taken a life of its own, however. Now, how do I know about all that? Well, I used to be one of those geeks. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I bought into Bitcoin when it was little more than $200 per coin. And let me tell you, the write-up has been quite the experience. And just in general, how cryptocurrency has gone from in the niches corners of the dark web to the topic of conversation on finance channels all over the globe. It is of immense interest to me and I'm sure to you, you know, to understand how we got here and where we're going and how you can keep your head, even as cryptocurrency goes up and down and all around. You have to understand how we got here and the evolution of cryptocurrency in general. And, you know, you really can divide it into three phases. Cryptocurrency really started out as a way to decentralize currency. The inventor, a mysterious mystery man, I'm not sure if there's any other kind of mysterious man, who may or may not be Satoshi Nakamoto, sought to create a way to transfer value for goods or services without having to rely on a central bank or even a local bank to help you do it. Leading to many new innovations, building off of white papers from various individuals, this person used the blockchain to create a new type of currency, a cryptocurrency that allows users to trade with each other without the need of a middleman to help validate their transactions, to store the results of said transaction, or to help keep track of all transactions that have ever existed. The innovations brought about by that first cryptocurrency led to many new innovations that were unthought of as little as 10 years ago. Things such as smart contracts, to new ways to store data, to completely automated finance, free from expensive middlemen, and money, free from the influence of politicians and bankers, who, according to some, only look out for their best interest when dealing with issues of public finance. Why do central bankers get such a bad rap in this? Well, maybe they shouldn't, maybe they should. But if you think about it, it all started out with central banks and their role with the money supply. Central banks have been in the mix of the money supply for as long as nation states have been a thing. And cryptocurrency is likely not going to change that. But understanding what they do is key to understanding why the advances in cryptocurrency are so revolutionary. And to understand what a central bank does, it helps to know what a wholesaler does. In the world of commerce, a wholesaler takes a commodity and prepares it in such a way that it can be sold in bulk to a retailer. This retailer will then take the bulk sales of the product and sell each of them with a markup. This markup is justified by the value additions that the retailer adds to the product, such as marketing, or making it attractive to end consumers who will then buy the product. So with that in mind, you can think of a central bank as a money wholesaler. The commodity, the currency, is created by a government body, such as the United States Treasury. The Treasury then sells the paper or coinage at cost to the central bank. The central bank then sells the currency to your retail bank and charges them various interest rates. Then, when you go to get a loan for a credit card, automobile, house, or business, your retail bank sells you that money, charging you an interest rate for the privilege. That is a high level view of how central banks work. Now, not every central bank works the same. And there are even more details than I let on in this brief intro. As a matter of fact, it sounds like that might be a good topic for another video. Like and subscribe. But this system works pretty well in principle and has been working for the most part for 100 years here in the United States and even longer in other places in the world. But like with anything else, there have been some complaints. And even more than that, general ideas to innovate with how we handle our personal finances. I guess one complaint, if you want to call it that, is that the government has a monopoly on the money supply. I am sure that most reasonable people can agree that monopolies are problematic at best and downright corrupt at worst. And this applies to just about all walks of business with a couple of key exceptions, whether it's commodities or retail outlets, even things like cell phone and internet providers. Everything is better for the consumer when there is some level of competition for their hard earned money or dollars and cryptocurrency enthusiasts would argue that is the case for money as well. If you want to use a different type of tender to pay your debts, why can't you? This monopoly on the money supply also has a rather unpleasant downside as well. The people in charge of the monopoly might be tempted to utilize the levers and switches of said monopoly to enrich themselves at the expense of the public's finances. 
in other words, inflating or perhaps deflating the currency in order to keep power, rather than doing the tough work of finding real solutions to fiscal problems. And there are indeed other issues that pop up when dealing with central banks, but cryptocurrencies upend all of them. They started out as a way to transfer money from person to person for the sales of goods and services with no middlemen, while simultaneously being transparent, secure, and anonymous, while at the same time providing access to a means of value transfer that is relatively safe from the manipulation of the various forces and that only look out to enrich themselves. Now that's sort of a broad statement that's not entirely true. A video on the most outrageous crypto scams will be forthcoming, so definitely like and subscribe. If you were, for example, to move all of your savings into Bitcoin and not into US dollars, you would more than likely survive any inflationary hiccups that are expected to arrive in the next several months, at least according to Fed Chairman Jerome Powell. And, but that's not all. But that's not all. Because with cryptocurrency, since there is no monopoly on the supply, each crypto coin is a unique blend of features that their founders envisioned. And because customers of currencies can leave at any time they like, they each have to provide a good value proposition to encourage customers to stay and use their coin. And because of this, cryptocurrency has evolved much faster than almost every other financial instrument that has ever existed. And this evolution can be considered to fall into three separate phases. The first phase being the phase of just pure value transfer. That is, just like the US dollar or the British pound, Japanese yen, etc. Cryptocurrency started out just as a way to transfer money back and forth between buyers and sellers. Bitcoin introduced the world to a digital, decentralized currency that can be utilized without the need of a middleman. The concept slowly but surely grew on people until the point that it is at today, where you can't buy a single Bitcoin without taking out a second mortgage on your house. Bitcoin then, as now, has had its detractors. When it was first introduced, it had various technical problems. For example, validating transactions in a very slow manner. Since it's based off of blockchain technology, like most cryptocurrencies, it has problems with its data footprint. You know, since every Bitcoin transaction ever is stored on every node that holds Bitcoin. So for example, if you have a Bitcoin wallet on your phone or on another device, technically it could grow infinitely and the data on your phone or the device has a limited amount. That could be a problem. In addition to that, you can no longer mine Bitcoin just using a graphics card that you bought at Best Buy, for example. You now need to be part of a global syndicate of sorts to validate any transactions and thus earn a new Bitcoin for yourself. The energy that it takes to do that has become a concern to folks who are environmentally minded, you know, since all that hardware is gonna take up a lot of electricity. And that electricity could be used for other things, not to mention the potential negative impacts that it has on the environment, such as the carbon footprint that it leaves. And let's not even get to the fact that Bitcoin in and of itself is really expensive probably one of the most expensive commodities ever. And more than likely, it's gonna to continue to be so. Many financial analysts predict that Bitcoin will reach $100,000 per coin, probably within the next year. Me personally, I'm predicting that it will happen around about June. And not only that, million dollar Bitcoins are within sight within a few short years. And this of course highlights other criticisms of the deflationary nature of Bitcoin. As of right now, Bitcoin is more or less being hoarded by folks that are waiting for the price of it to go up and up and up, including yours truly. Throughout the years, several challengers to the throne have sought to fix some of the technical and other issues that have plagued Bitcoin. Cryptocurrencies like Litecoin sought to improve the speed of transaction verification. Dogecoin tried to tackle the issue of the deflationary nature of Bitcoin by being one of the few inflationary, decentralized, non-stablecoin cryptocurrencies. And of course, there are several others in the same vein that have started up, but each one improved upon the last one. And that spirit of improvement led to the creation of the second generation of cryptocurrency. That is, crypto that focused on more than just being value transfer token, but on changing the way the world does its personal finance. And I'm talking about the smart contract cryptocurrencies. These coins focus on the fact that if the money is digital, then it can also be programmable, meaning that your money can really work for you while you sleep. But other financial instruments that you're fond of can do that as well. Things like futures contracts or even mortgages could all be programmed to execute certain steps once other thresholds are met. Cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and its token Ether and other Ethereum variants took the reins during this evolution of the cryptocurrency, with quite a few cryptocurrencies basing themselves on the Ethereum stack. Others still focused on providing the data to make smart contracts work better, like Chainlink. Without the data to help make decisions, smart contract cryptocurrencies are just as confounded as anything else when it comes to making money. And then there was the third wave of cryptocurrency. This was a series of cryptocurrencies that took the lessons of the second generation of cryptos and sought to improve the governance and performance of that generation. Coins like Cardano, ADA, Polkadot, were designed to take the promises of cryptocurrency even farther, with Cardano being created to tackle the problem of governance and regulatory compliance, as well as issues like scalability and interoperability between cryptocurrencies. Coins like Polkadot and its token DOT were developed to help 
users launch their own blockchains, creating a truly decentralized internet. But with all these evolutions in cryptocurrency, one must wonder, do people really understand what it is they're investing in? I'm sure you understand that all these things are great and they will truly revolutionize the way we all do finance with each other and even across the web. That said though, we all should be cautious about the investments that we make in cryptocurrency. In fact, in any in any asset that we make. The number one principle of investing is understand what you are investing in. And if you don't understand it, do not invest in it. And my fear is quite a few people do not understand what they're getting into when they're investing in cryptocurrency. Are they investing in a commodity? Are they investing in a stock or a bond? What What is it exactly that you're investing in when you invest in a cryptocurrency? No matter if it's first wave, second wave, third wave. When you invest in a stock, you're investing in a company that's providing goods and services to a customer. Your investment helps them to accomplish that goal. And you're rewarded for the confidence in the company by receiving dividends from them, or at the very least, price appreciation of the stock, since others are trying to own the stock as well, driving its price up. A lot of cryptocurrencies that are out there right now are still in their infancies and are not really providing value to much of anyone. Quite a few cryptocurrencies are not really selling themselves as a way, as the way to transfer value between each other, but they're really providing a way for Example, decentralization of the internet, or as a way to help other cryptocurrencies with data for their smart contracts and things of that nature. And that said, they're not really providing a good or a service to anybody yet. It's quite possible that investors all over the world will take notice of this fact at the same time and abandon cryptocurrencies in mass. There's also the possibility that cryptocurrency could face harsh regulatory scrutiny in the near future, which could neuter it and all of its effectiveness. After all, Quite a bit of what cryptocurrency is providing is in direct competition to central banks and regulators may not appreciate that competition. That said, however, it does not mean that what these coins are doing is not worthwhile or that in the end, they won't be really worth something. It is simply a warning to stay the course no matter what storm can pop up now or in the near future. Weathering storms is what we do here at Finance Squared. Batten down the hatches with us by subscribing and turning on post notifications as we have more videos on cryptocurrency coming up in the very near future, as well as videos on other financial education topics that I know you'll enjoy. But just keep in mind that a goal without a plan is a wish, and a goal with a plan and no action is a wish list. Take action on your personal financial future, and I'll catch up with you next time. Peace.